The lines that divide countries are also powerful in dividing society from within, as, for example, racism carves its own boundaries. A victim of racial profiling, Korean immigrant Chol Soo Lee was sentenced to life in prison for a San Francisco murder he did not commit. In 1970s America, his case inspired a grassroots social justice movement within the Asian American community. Now, a new critically acclaimed documentary, Free Chol Su Lee, traces his story and the movement that led to his release. Hari Srinivasan talked to co-directors Julie Ha and Eugene Yi about the life and legacy of Lee. Thanks, Julie Ha and Eugene Yi. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, first, Julie, for people who might not have watched the documentary, uh, who's Chol Su? Chol Su Lee, um, he's the Korean, he was a Korean immigrant um, who was wrongfully convicted um, of a Chinatown gang murder in San Francisco in the 1970s. Um, and his case gets um, picked up by uh, a Korean American journalist working for a mainstream newspaper um, who investigates and writes a series of stories that help trigger a landmark pan Asian American social justice movement um, to free Chol Su Lee. Um, and so the story uh, tells that story of, um, of his uh, conviction, his, um, the fight for his release, um, but also what happens to him after his release. Um, unfortunately, it's not a fairy tale ending. Yeah. Eugene, uh, let's start at the beginning if we can. What, what, how did he grow up? What was his life like? So Chol Su Lee was a child of the Korean War. He was born during the Korean War, actually on Korea, the day that would become Korean or Korean Liberation Day, August 15th, um, in a broken home. And uh, his mother married a GI and came to the United States. He would join her uh, once he once he was twelve, um, after growing up in, in in dire poverty in Korea, in South Korea, and uh, but once he came to the United States, it wasn't quite the American dream that that he had been hoping for. He had been hoping to come and be able to work and save money and send it back to his aunt and uncle in Korea. But instead, he met a series of obstacles that just made his life here very very difficult. Um, he was bullied severely in school. Um, he was. <clears throat> He actually sort of got into a fight quite early on, uh, was taken to the principal, uh, to the vice principal. An altercation ensued between him and the vice principal, and he was actually charged with battery as a child, um, as a minor. And that sort of started him on his course through the school to prison pipeline that sort of was really the beginning of kind of the difficulties that he had in America that in some ways culminated with his arrest in 1973 for this murder that he did not commit. One night, the manager showed me his gun. It was the first time I ever held a gun before. I asked if I could borrow it. Back in my place, I was cocking it back and forth, you know, messing around with it. Then accidentally shot the wall. Five days later, I was arrested. But when he told me it was for a murder, I couldn't believe what they were saying. So Julie, let's talk a little bit about the murder and the circumstances surrounding it. Um, you go into the kind of initial police reports. Um, what was kind of at the core, what was wrong with the conviction in the first place? Well, yes. Um, you know, when they arrested Chol Su Lee, the reason the police focused on him uh, was because um, they found um, a report of a police gun accident that Chol Su Lee was involved in just a couple of days prior to the murder. Um, and so they did do a ballistics um, report. Um, and um, uh, basically that incident was about um, Chol Su Lee accidentally firing um, his gun in, in, um, in, in his room. And um, the police came and recovered the bullets um, from that room. Nobody was hurt. Um, it just was lodged into the wall. Um, but once the police did a ballistics test, um, looking at that bullets and the bullets that were used in the actual murder, they they actually said it was a match. Um, it, later, it was discovered that it was not a match, but that's what set them on the course, even to focus on Chol Su Lee. Um, and then, um, but when you look at um, when they got to the actual murder trial, um, they had already discovered that that was um, a mistake. Um, and he, uh, Chol Su was convicted, not based on material evidence, but based on the uh, witness accounts of three white tourists who saw um, the killer for mere seconds from quite a distance away. Um, you know, you'll, in, in our film, you'll see that, um, you know, even during the, the murder trial, it's quite astounding because at one point, um, the arresting police officer 
uh, points to Chol Su Li and says, yes, that's the man I arrested. Um, but he says that that Chinese man sitting there um, and uh, even Chol Su's court appointed defense attorney did not correct that for the record and say um, Chol Su Li is actually a Korean, not Chinese. Um, and so, you know, there was some kind of racial profiling um, that seemed quite evident in this case. Um, and, you know, K.W. Lee, the journalist who did the investigation um, on this case, he even made note of how um, when he talked to people on the ground in Chinatown, uh, many people actually knew that, you know, Chol Su didn't commit this murder. They knew who the real killer was. And also they knew that a Chinatown gang would not have hired um, Chol Su Lee, a Korean, um, to, to, for this, for this um, killing. At the time of his sort of initial incarceration, it wasn't as big a story as it became after uh, a single journalist started to investigate into this. So tell us a little bit about the, the role that uh, K.W. Lee played as a journalist and then really as someone in Chol Su Lee's life. That's right. Um, Chol Su Lee was already um, uh, four years into his life sentence by the time um, K.W. Lee stumbled upon the case. Um, and K.W. heard about the case from a Korean American social worker who just said in passing, um, it's so sad, there's this young man and I think he was you know, railroaded for this murder. And so K.W. Lee like, was um, surprised um, to hear about this Korean American who had been uh, convicted by a jury of a Chinatown gang murder. Um, so he looked into the case and he was shocked um, that he was um, already finding um, evidence that seemed to really poke holes in the police um, and San Francisco DA's investigation, investigation and prosecution of Chol Su Lee. Um, he, he actually, you know, I think it's worth noting that he worked for a Sacramento newspaper called the Sacramento Union. And he, he worked for six months looking into this case on his own time um, and was just shocked by what he discovered. KW told us um, that actually this was like the first time um, in his long, um, decades long career as a reporter where he um, did a story about a Korean immigrant and um, he felt a real connection um, even after, um, you know, he wrote a total of about 100 stories on the Chol Su Lee case. So Eugene, it, it's not a simple narrative of an innocent man is behind bars because while Chol Su Lee is in prison, he's accused of a murder within the walls. How did K.W. Lee, and I guess the movement that sprung up around Cholsu, deal with that? No, you're right. It's a very difficult thing to try and convince folks of, of the innocence of this man when he, he had to uh, kill in self-defense while he was behind bars. Another, another sad aspect of the timing of Chelsea's life was that there was a, a tremendous violence in the California prison system at the time. And that's where Chelsea ended up. And that's how he got caught up in this situation. But um, to some level, it is a credit to two things. One, to the organizational abilities of the Korean immigrants who were there at the time. There was a community of Korean immigrants in Sacramento that KW was a part of, and that formed a financial and an organizational backbone for a lot of their efforts. And the other part is really a credit to K.W. Lee's ability and, and the way that his stories were able to frame Chol Su's plight into something that was broadly legible to the population at the time. Leonard, what's to be gained by all the um, support? Anything? You make it sound contrived. These people came because they wanted to come. So they're doing it because they feel it's right. This didn't automatically turn into, a, all right, let's open the gates and let him out. I mean, this was a long process. This was a long process. Um, you know, uh, Chol Su was in prison for a total of 10 years. Um, the movement start, the movement lasted six years. Um, so sustained um, effort um, of this very, you know, unique combination of people, as Eugene mentioned, of Korean immigrants working alongside third generation Asian American, you know, young, young student activists, many of them, um, but working for six long years um, to free Chol Su Lee um, and having to basically, you know, they were raised, they raised uh, money um, through a lot of five, $10 donations um, in order to hire uh, good defense attorneys 
um, for Chelsea Lee and, and uh, a good defense investigator. And that's how a lot of this um, evidence or, or even a new witness was uncovered. Um, but it was, um, you know, I think if you ask any lawyer uh, to overturn two murder convictions um, is unheard of in our criminal justice system. Um, and so in, in many ways, it's an extraordinary movement. They, they, they sort of did the impossible. Cholsu was in prison for 10 years. After he got out, or after he was released, his life was by no means smooth sailing. Tell us a little bit about some of the challenges he faced. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do want to foreground just everything he had been through in his life before then. I mean, from ages 20 through 30, he was in prison for a murder he didn't commit. We don't get into it much in the film, but he spent much of that time in solitary confinement as well, which, which of course, <clears throat> intensifies that experience. And so he had spent his entire adult life behind bars, essentially, and didn't know how to be functioning on the outside, outside of an institutional context. So there, there are the demons of institutionalization that, of course, he was going to be wrestling with. There's everything he went through in his childhood, just from, again, coming, growing up as a child of war in a broken home and being in that school to prison pipeline the way he'd been. So beyond that, on top of that, we throw on this, this the stature that he gained, you know, and he, he spoke on that to a certain extent that, you know, this was this kind of iconic status was not something that he'd asked for. And so as he grappled with that, it, 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 it wore on him and, and he really struggled with, with, with so much of it, but he struggled with disappointing all of the activists so much because, you know, what we would often talk about was that the activists um, and his supporters often became something of a, of a sur surrogate family for him. And they really tried to do what they could to help support him. But at that time, there was no sense of what coming back into society would, would, would involve. There was no sense of this conversation about around recidivism that, that we have a bit more of now. And so in that context, Chol Su, you know, he fell into addiction and his life kind of spiraled out in the way that anybody who has dealt with a family member or a loved one who has to struggle with addiction knows, knows all too well how that, can, how that can go. Julie, why make this film? Why make this documentary? Yes. Um, well, if this, this, this story is not known um, and it needs to be known. This is, this is an important part of of history, um, not just Asian American history, I would argue for American history. And I, I happened to have gone to the funeral of, of Chol Su Lee in 2014. And it was actually there where I feel like looking back, the seeds were probably planted um, to make this film. Um, the activists um, who had come to Chol Su's aid decades earlier were there, Kato B. Lee was there. Um, and there was an emotion in there that just felt beyond grief for someone um, they had lost and cared about. It felt like um, there was just this intense heaviness. Um, I was struck by how a couple of the activists were saying um, Chol Su did more for them than he, you know, um, than they did for him, um, yeah. or just deep regret um, that um, they didn't do enough. Um, and um, at one point, K.W. Lee stood up um, and he was clutching this Buddhist monk's walking stick that Chelsu had carved for him. And he just said angrily, like, why is this story still underground after all these years? This landmark Asian American social justice movement that coalesced around this poor Korean immigrant street kid um, overturned two murder convictions and succeeded in freeing him from prison. Why is this case not known? It's not even taught in Asian American studies in American universities and colleges. Um, and that was... Um, a deep ache for him because I think he knew how how singular the story was and how consequential it could be and that there could be a meaningful legacy even today. Um, and that's why we made the film. This, this story was too important to let it stay buried in history. And we just had to excavate it and, and tell it while um, some of the firsthand sources were still alive um, to share the story. Julie, what is it about now that makes this film more relevant. I mean, we have just lived through or are living through a pandemic where we've seen increased amounts of violence against Asian Americans. Um, we just recently had a, a sort of another anniversary of the murder of Vincent Chin go by. I mean, why is this conversation important today? 
we feel like our film actually connects the dots between what's happening now and our history, which is not known. Um, some people, you know, uh, are surprised that there's um, that racism against Asian Americans even exists, and that it's not just microaggressions; that it's actually uh, racism in the form of violence. Um, we we feel like our film is co you know connecting to this history where actually there's a long there's a long history of anti Asian racism that includes violence that includes racial profiling and injustices within um, the criminal justice system. So um, we feel like that history is just so important for us to know in order uh, for it to feed our consciousness and also um, you know how it affects our perspective today. Um, oftentimes. You know, um, I'll say that Asian Americans maybe don't see ourselves um, connected to issues of um, incarceration, policing in communities of color, um, reentry. Um, but it, those are our issues um, too. And if we know our history, we'll see those connections more. Uh, we'll, we'll understand why it's important also um, to, to care about Black Lives Matter and um, what's happening with other communities and other causes. We, we can see those very organic intersections. We feel like our film could help people draw some kind of inspiration um, from, from this group of people that came together um, at a time, I should note, when Asian Americans had very little political power, and yet they formed this movement um, against incredible odds. Um, they 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 fought the fought and stood up for the to the criminal justice system, um, and they asserted this very important principle. You know, um, they coalesced around not somebody who was um, some undergrad at UC Berkeley who was wrongly wrongfully convicted. It was this poor Korean immigrant street kid who had a criminal record at the time, who was no model minority, and yet they looked at looked at him and said, you know, you are worthy of our time, attention, love, and care, and we will dedicate six years of our lives to freeing you from prison. Um, and I think that's such a powerful principle and act um, of courage, conviction, and compassion that could really just have um, such lasting um, inspiration today. And, and in a way, you know, um, extend the legacy of, of Chelsea Lee um, in a way that I think he would have wanted to see. Eugenie, Julie Ha, thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us.